I always have to keep myself from uh, dancing in that glass tire. I always wait. I always know it's going to pick up. And I'm like, don't do it, Terry. Hold back. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you to Tuesday evenings at the Modern. I'm Terry Thornton. I'm curator of education. And I'd like to um, thank the uh, Texas-based online magazine, Glass Tire, for their support of our program and for, um, you for joining us tonight, both on site and online. Um, this is an exciting week here at the Modern. As we look forward to uh, the weekend's opening of Milton Avery, Avery um, a, a thorough but intimate look at the work of a single devoted artist of a particular time. I have to say, I walked through the exhibition, it's still in the, um, it's still being installed, uh, last touch is put on, but it's very exciting. Um, it's very unusual and very exciting. And tonight is a special um, preview of sorts by the exhibition's curator, Edith Devaney, who until January 2021 was the modern and contemporary curator at the Royal Academy of Arts, where she conceived and began curating Milton Avery. Um, now, um, she is managing director and curator for David Hockney Inc. and David Hockney Foundation. Um, at the Royal Academy, she curated exhibitions included David Hockney, A Bigger Picture in 2012, um, Abstract Expressionism in 2016, um, which, if I understood correctly, uh, may have in fact sparked a special interest in Avery's work. Um, and in 2017, uh, to my mind, the brilliantly titled uh, Jasper John's Something Resembling Truth. I think that's a spectacular title. I love that title. Um, as well as curating um, the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition for 20 years. Um, she has written extensively on art and more recently curated Arshel Gorky 1904 to 1948 for the um, Ka Pissarro uh, Museum in Venice. We are in for a very big treat, so if you would, please join me in welcoming Edith Devaney. Thank you. So I just start by putting up this, um, this self-portrait of, um, of Milton Avery from 1941. And it, it's an intriguing work. It, it's full of humor. It's typical of him. And it, it reminds me very much of, of the Pierre Bonnard interior, where the figure is in, in one space and there's an open door revealing a space behind. So it's that sort of complexity that he brings into his work. But it, it's, a, it's just a wonderful image of him. So it's a, it's a great honor and, frankly, a bit of a surprise, given the recent travel restrictions over the past year and a half, to be here and to be invited to give this talk. And it's also a wonderful experience to witness the opening of this exhibition of Milton Avery's work. The ongoing pandemic has inevitably seen many exhibitions canceled and rescheduled, loan agreements subject to constant churn of amendments and, withdraw and withdrawals. So it's a particular joy that we open this exhibition here at the Modern. And it's testament to the Modern's director, Dr. Marla Price, and to the um, chief curator, Andrea Carnes, that this exhibition is here, the first venue in a three museum international tour. Of course, the exhibition is only possible through a huge collective effort, working closely with lenders and with the benefit of the enormous support of the Milton Avery Trust, the artist's daughter, March Avery Kavanagh, and his grandson, Sean Kavanagh, who is here with us this evening. Thank you, Sean. Um, and as so many of these loans are in place due to the tenacity of Wakas Wujahat, who persuaded many of the museums and private collectors to lend to the exhibition. And as a result, this exhibition has emerged unscathed in terms of its reach, ambition, and focus. So in thinking about this talk and, and what I wanted to cover and what information might enhance the visitor's understanding of the exhibition's premise, I was struck once again by the complexity of looking at Avery both as an artist and of considering his place within the canon of modern American art. 
For while the accessibility of his work and its non-dependence on academic interpretation are hallmarks of Avery's style, the development of his art and the place he occupies in modern art history are more challenging to unravel. As with his work, what looks, and indeed is harmonious on the surface, belies a much greater complexity at its core. What I'm really saying is that Avery appears simple, and I say that in the best meaning of the word, but he isn't, and the work isn't. Each work is a careful, considered distillation of a lifetime of observation and understanding. Um, and therefore it gives it a, its complexity, and this is coupled with a formidable drive and work ethic. And I say all of this um, in some part to excuse the wide-ranging number of subjects and directions which I'll be covering in this talk, where I'll be looking at Avery's development and his location in the trajectory of American modernism, as well as of his legacy. I will also be referencing at times the particular thesis which lies behind the curation of this exhibition, of his work and his enduring influence. So not wishing to be self-indulgent, I do just want to describe my own particular route to Avery's work, which led to the instigation of this exhibition, because, and, and Terry touched on this briefly, because in some part I think it's informative of his past and ongoing status. Anyone who has the merest knowledge of American art is familiar with Avery's work, and I've long been aware of him, but have had very few opportunities to see his work in Europe. And in my regular contact with contemporary artists, I was conscious that many of them cited him as a major inspiration for his unique approach to color in his compositions. Artists such as the, the young British artist, the YBA Gary Hume, and the artist Peter Doig are key examples of this. And I learned a lot from both of them and others about how they saw Avery's work from an artist's perspective. As the late art historian Dory Ashton so accurately noted, Avery is a painter's painter. And indeed his art was and continues to be held in the highest regard by other painters. So in, um, this work actually isn't in the exhibition, but in, in, 19, um, in 2014, I came across this work, Woman Ironing, which is a small painting. It's in the Cantor Collection at Stanford University. And I was immediately struck, kind of coming across it by accident, at the extent to which it, it stood like a jewel amongst other great American works of the 20th century. It was very, very compelling. And it's typical of Avery's painting for this time with the quotidian subject treated in the most effective way by the use of color. It's reminiscent of so many of the European modernist painters. My first thought was Felix Vallotton and Edgar Degas as well for the effective use of the dynamic diagonal. And in the, the contrast that he um, presents between the dark floor and the light blue walls with the intimation of a doorway scratched onto the surface of the thin blue paint it's, it, it's really quite a, a remarkable work. And what's also of note is the relationship between the figure of the woman and the ironing board. Um, both very, you know, the ironing board very pedestrian, but it, it, it's treated in the most exceptional way. And both are described in complementary colors, ranging from pink through orange and into red hues. And this has the effect of unifying the figure and the object in absolute harmony. It was executed in 1945, which is the point at which Avery made his breakthrough in colour, which of course I will come on to in a little bit more detail later. And my second and meaningful focus on Avery's work was through abstract expressionism. I initiated and curated a large exhibition of American abstract expressionism in London at the Royal Academy of Arts in 2016. And during my detailed research leading up to the exhibition, Avery's name kept coming up again and again in source material. His position of being so close to the emergence of abstract expressionism made me want to interrogate his work and, contribu and, and his contribution to post-war American art in more detail, which led me to this exhibition. And, and working with Wakas on the, de uh, on, um, the uh, all of the, 
putting the David Smith selection together for abstract expressionism led us to having conversations and, and, and quite a lot of discourse around Avery and his role within the unfolding of that movement. And he subsequently introduced me to March and Sean, and things gathered a pace from that point. So I also, in this lecture, want to consider Avery's development as an artist, as explored, um, it is explored in the exhibition here, and the techniques he employed to achieve his unique compositions. The extent to which he also absorbed influences from other artists, particularly from European modernism, is also something that I will touch on. So I just want to talk a little bit about his beginnings. This is a wonderful photograph from the 1920s of Avery painting. And Avery's route towards being established in the art world was both unconventional and lengthy. He was born in 1885 into a working class family which settled near Hartford in Connecticut. His father supported the family by working as a tanner and Avery left school without graduating, starting work in a factory at the age of 16. And in 1905, he enrolled in a course of commercial lettering at the Connecticut League of Art Students. And this was an attempt to further his earning prospects and was most likely prompted by the untimely death of his father at the beginning of the same year, which placed pressure on him to support the family. Encouraged by the League's art teacher to transfer to a drawing class a month later when the lettering class was discontinued, his attendance of the art evening classes and related discussions continued until 1918, when he transferred to the School of Art Society of Hartford. The art training that Avery received across both organizations was traditional and academic, but at the same time it was largely part-time and somewhat informal. But Avery received artistic training for 15 years. But because the course didn't result in a recognized qualification, as a consequence, some have stated that perhaps unfairly, I think, that Avery was somewhat self-taught and he was certainly self-motivated from the start. And it, it was clear that his auto, he had an autodidactic propensity, which was honed by his many years of attending these classes. And that continued unabated throughout the rest of his career, ensuring his constant artistic development. He always put pressure on himself to, to, bring, to, to bring his work to the next stage. And he was confident enough from his earliest years to experiment as an artist. And he, he also, you know, one of the things I, I really note about Avery is his willingness to experiment in, in, in public, to, um, to, to always kind of, you know, develop new work and, and show it, push it out there, which was, was kind of constantly putting pressure on himself. And then later, his, um, his, his training didn't end because when he went to New York, he attended drawing classes at the Art Student League for a number of years. And the reason for this self-imposed length of training is unknown, but he did feel sufficiently proficient and committed to describe himself in his, occup as an, his occupation as being an artist by, 11, by 1911. So he had no doubt, sense of self-doubt regarding his ability. And this confidence would have been confirmed by the approbation, albeit on a modest scale, which followed from 1915 when he started to exhibit locally. His work from this period is accomplished, though traditional, and reflects the influence of his teachers and their allegiance to American Impressionism. And indeed, American Impressionism exerted a strong hold on all of Avery's contemporaries. And I show here a slide by John Henry Twatchman. Um, and the depiction of the natural world as seen as American Impressionists, such as, as Twatchman and Ernest Lawson, held a lot of appeal both to Avery and his, his, um, his contemporaries. And one of the things that he, he really uh, um, was, was, was interested in was their um, determination to, to always work directly from the motif. So they were outdoors looking directly at their subject. And this is, this is a work by, um, by Lawson, Approaching Storm. So the lessons that Avery learned from the American Impressionist during his long artistic training laid the foundations to his approach throughout his career. He assumed into his own practice as a fundamental principle their regard for painting directly from the motif. He espoused the importance of verisimilitude and of fidelity to the evocation of a sense of place, which became such an important thing for his, his work right to the end. 
And from his earliest landscapes executed in Connecticut, Avery demonstrated his engagement with the natural world at first hand. So he started working on a small portable scale, and these accomplished landscapes, which dated from 1918, show his burgeoning grasp of composition. And they also reveal his instinctive sensibility to color and an early understanding of the importance of reproducing the effects of light. And this is such a beautiful, kind of accomplished early work, very confident. And you see him here imitating elements of Lawson's technique in particular. And here Avery is using a palette knife to apply the paint where he blends it onto the canvas with his finger to create a smooth surface on each of the impasto paint marks. And the smooth enamel-like mark then contributes to that sense of variegated light that spreads across the, um, the, the whole, the whole um, composition, kind of giving it a refracted surface which works in concert with the color. But his, his ability to, um, to achieve that, that reflection of water and describe the water is so beautifully done. Avery's instinct for color was recognized by others even at this early stage in his career. And he began receiving his first mentions in group exhibitions by the 1920s. And one of his first and earliest um, advocates was um, Henry McBride who worked for the New York, New York Sun and he was to remain a steadfast supporter of Avery's developing work over many years. Reviewing a group exhibition in New York in January 2029, McBride singled out Milton Avery as a new and promising painter. His canvases are somber in tone, but the color is rich and the man has a genuine instinct for painting. It's important to remember that Avery was focusing on landscape and portraiture at the same time as the American realist painters and, and regionalism was at its height. And these movements included artists such as Grant Wood and Thomas Hart Benton, who famously went on to tutor the young Jackson Pollock. And although they too were working figuratively, Avery's approach to figuration was wildly different from these contemporaries. And unlike them, he eschewed any socio-political subject matter and in his early and mid-career subjects, he represented everyday life, taking much from the European modernist painters, where the deliberate ordinariness of the subject served to highlight the work's composition. And this rendered his vision a more universal one, as opposed to the native concerns of the regionalist and, and realist painters. For unlike the work of his contemporaries, and to a certain extent this was repeated again with the younger abstract expressionist work, Avery's paintings did not emerge from the concerns which were radically changing American life, the Wall Street crash of 1929 and resultant economic devastation, the Second World War, the nuclear bomb and the Cold War. His singularity of vision enabled him to retain his inherent focus on the harmony of his paintings, a perfect balance between composition and subject. And this isn't to suggest in any way that Avery was indifferent or insensible to the momentous changes that were, were taking place around him. But any emotion engendered in his work was, as he put it himself, the emotion aroused in me by the impact with the original idea. This understanding of what was essentially expressionism was not lost in the younger abstract expressionists who developed this notion still further with the emotional element effectively becoming the painting's subject. And Mark Rothko claimed later that he, Rothko, was only interested in expressing basic human emotion. Avery and his wife settled in New York in 1925 at a time of great cultural and societal change. And the darkening of Avery's palette, which can be seen here, reflected some of these somber times. But his arrival in the city also coincided with the beginning of what was to become one of the most creative periods of regeneration in America's cultural history. Starting in 1929 with the opening of MoMA under the direction of the visionary Alfred Barr, the Whitney Museum of Art opening three years later, and by the 1930s, many influential artists and intellectuals fleeing the rise of Nazism in Europe had settled in New York. So Joseph Albers and later Hans Hoffmann resumed their teaching practice in America, exporting many European practices to the US. 
and by the 1940s, Marcel Duchamp, André Breton, Max Ernst, and Roberta Matta, amongst others, had arrived, making an inevitable impact in New York's artistic community and bringing with them a deeper understanding of the recent major European artistic movements, which, which were critical, of course, to the, um, to the development of abstract expressionism. And as he had done in the countryside in New York, um, in the countryside in New York, Avery turned his gaze towards his surroundings. And although compositionally interesting and in reflecting some of the design elements that had appeared in his recent landscapes, New York clearly was not and never would be an enduring subject for him. City is a good example of his urban compositions, and it conveys the compression and, and, and just a touch of gloom of the of city and the brink of, of the Great Depression. But in this work, he's, you can see he's already beginning to distort form and perspective and is applying his paint more thinly and with less texture. Avery gravitated towards events and gatherings in the city which showed people enjoying themselves activities which took them out of their everyday life experience. And this very ambitious work, Chariot Race, which he, he um, executed incredibly quickly, um, is, is done with a great deal of bravado and, and easy humor. And that's something that, that Avery has, is able to effortlessly eject into his paintings really deftly. And this is the largest early work that he did, and largest work that he did before the Provincetown paintings of the 1950s. And we know that Avery was a regular visitor to museums and galleries, and he and Sally, his wife, devoted every Saturday to museum visits. And one of the things I've enjoyed doing has been one of those kind of hobby exercises I've been, enjoyed doing over the past few years while working on this project, is to see if certain influences in his work can be traced to exhibitions which happened at the time and that he must have seen. And I was so struck by this as a subject and the way he treated it that I was delighted to find this work by um, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, which is the Cirque Fernando. And this, the subject of the circus with its frenzy of whirling activity and strange and distorted composition seems to bear some resemblance to, to this, this a work of the same subject by, by Toulouse-Lautrec. And given um, both the dates of a MoMA exhibition and Avery's um, uh, very, very regular museum visits, I, I feel that it is likely that he came across this work. Avery also sought out, sought out local scenes, that, which were, sort of took him away from the built environment and closer to the natural world, where he felt more comfortable. And Coney Island provided an opportunity to combine human activity with the landscape, which was a practice he began in the early 1930s and made regular and increasingly, um, it became regularly featured and increasingly successfully in his work for the rest of his career. And here in Coney Island, he depicts this seething mass of day trippers, and he captures the collective feeling of abandon. And one of the things he does to create this great sense of perspective is foreshortening the reclining bodies lying in the sand. And they're framed against this dense backdrop of, of them, of standing figures, with a crowd of people obscuring the landscape. And it's only really the attire which indicates the beach location. But it's a, it's a wonderful... Um, it's a wonderful composition. But what's also kind of remarkable is this. Um, it's painted in the same year, and it's a very, very strong exemplar of the experimentation with which Avery frequently approached his work. And here, the shoreline replaces the horizon and renders the landscape more of a construct. And in the pairing back of detail and near abstraction of much of the form, as well as the muted hues, it's very prescient of the sparse landscapes he was to paint in Provincetown in the 1950s and 60s. And throughout the first half of his career, there's many instances, and this painting is, is most certainly one of them, when Avery almost gets ahead of himself momentarily, and often in a single work, he leaps forward to anticipate his future direction. With his reticence to talk or in any way explain his work, his why talk when you can paint is his much quoted remark. Avery has left very scant verbal or written matter relating to his work. So it's rather difficult to charge his psychological and intellectual development alongside that of his painting. 
However, he didn't, although he was a quiet person by all accounts, he didn't shy away from others who approached art from a different perspective, nor those who had a more apparently intellectual inclination. The artist and poet David Burlick was one of Avery's more cerebral friends, and he'd been a close associate of Wassily Kandinsky and was described as being the father of Russian futurism. Avery painted Berlick several times, and he's the principal figure in the dessert. This is a, a work from, we've borrowed from MoMA for the show. And it's a wonderful compositional piece um, taken from a very interesting angle. Um, the, uh, Avery actually did more than one painting of Berlick and his wife, and the, 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 the little figure with the green face and the stretched out neck is, is, um, is I think, his wife. It's very similar to another painting of the two. But I think that in terms of composition, it's such a fascinating work. And John D. Graham was another um, Russian intellectual artist and writer, and a very close and long-term friend and supporter of Avery's work, and was one of the most celebrated cultural figures in New York in the 1930s and 40s. Graham maintained close connections to the European art scene and acted almost like a kind of go-between between, between Europe and, and America and was a mentor to Arshil Gorky, to Willem de Kooning, and David Smith, introducing them all to different artistic currents in Europe and beyond. And it's therefore of great interest that Avery and he had a strong friendship. Avery even befriended Marcel Duchamp, teaching him how to play pool, much to Duchamp's delight, during a summer they spent together at McDowell, an artist colony in Peterborough, New Hampshire, in 1954. And then, of course, Avery's protégés, Mark Rothko and Barnett Newman in particular, were also of a very strong intellectual inclination and all very much valued their time with Avery and their discussions with him about the practice and theory of art. So I, the point I'm making, really, is that Avery must therefore have displayed a very open and intelligent engagement with many different ideas and perspectives. And these inevitably found it, their way into his work. So Avery fully embraced the artistic scene in New York, and he and Sally were known as very welcoming hosts, with the younger artist Mark Rothko and Gottlieb visiting, often daily. Avery had first met Rothko in 1928 when they showed together at the Opportunity Gallery, and through him went on to befriend Gottlieb and later Barnett Newman, with all three of these artists readily acknowledging Avery's influence on their work. So this is a slide of, of um, a photo of Avery and Sally sketching in Gloucester in 1945. So Avery never wavered from his reliance on his own vision, and nowhere is that more evident than in his landscapes and seascapes. And his move to New York heralded a new way of working, and he established a routine of relocating with his family to an area of natural beauty during the summer months of each year, often joined by Rothko and Gottlieb. And there he would draw and paint in watercolour and paper directly from the subject, just as he had done in Connecticut during his artistic apprenticeship. And these watercolours would then be developed into oil paintings, translated in, into, onto canvas back in his New York studio over the subsequent year. And despite working at some remove, Avery had an innate ability to conjure up the atmosphere of the place he was describing. And each place he visited would give rise to subtle changes in his palette and composition, as well as contributing to the overall development of his work. He often revisited the same spots many times, Gloucester, Massachusetts, Vermont, the Gaspé Peninsula, and eastern Canada, with works developed from each setting, revealing a distinctly different ambience. I want to show a couple more slides of early landscapes, just to demonstrate how... Um, how quickly Avery was developing his style. This is a, a, a little bit like Seaside. It's another work um, that, that is a, an example of, of Avery kind of leaping forward and really anticipating his, his, his work of the future. And this is, um, the date is somewhere in the 1930s. But you've, you've got that kind of gentle undulation. Everything is softening. So it's a big change from the, that early landscape I, sh I showed from um, 1918. And then this is at the end of the 30s. And um, it's changing still. A again, it's flattening a little bit more. There's a lot of patterning happening in the sky and the sea. 
um, the, the, there's this wonderful um, kind of variegated uh, um, green of the, of the landscape. So in 1944, Milton Avery's career took a significant step forward. The previous year, he'd signed up to the prestigious gallery of Paul Rosenberg & Co, founded in France, but recently opened in New York, and it represented many French modernist painters, including Matisse, Picasso, and Braque. And of course, one of the, the, the wonderful things for Avery is belonging to that gallery was his access to seeing these works firsthand in, in the racks, which he, he did. He took advantage of that. Um, Avery also had a one-man show, um, a one-man museum exhibition at the Phillips Memorial Gallery in Washington, D.C. in 1944. And this, this rather wonderful self-portrait um, shows a very confident figure of Avery. Again, he's distorting his figure. He, 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 he never flattered himself. He painted himself often, but never flattered himself, often with very red ears. Um, and uh, it's, it's, he's... he's um, do you see the, the, the script? He's, he's uh, noting the galleries that he's shown at. So it's, it's, it's really him at sort of the height of his, um, his, his confidence and, and, and showing in many places, both um, museums and in commercial galleries. But it was a very important moment for him because it was the year that also marked a significant breakthrough in Avery's work. And it was at this point that all his former and consistent development culminated in a series of compositions that was to change the course of his career. His keen interest in colour, which was already evident from the 1930s, evolved still further, and he began to lighten, flatten, and layer his pigment onto the canvas, creating a luminosity across closely related planes of differing tone, with each colour modulated to complement the adjacent hue, rather than to provide contrast. And this, along with a simultaneous simplification of form, replaced traditional perspective in his work with a more subtle intimation of depth and atmosphere, both of which he evoked with colour. As first seen in the 1944 paintings and exemplified in two figures at a desk. And again, this is such a, this is, it's, it's such a brilliant example of this, of this new development in his work. Um, and it's just that compositional harmony which he achieves so much through, through colour and reducing form. You know, the, the standing figure, the, the angle of the head reminiscent of the, um, the, the David Berlick's wife in, in the dessert. Um, but she's kind of wearing these, these clothes which are kind of very close in, in tone. Um, and then the, the browns of the desk and it's separated in between by the white of the, the girl's dress with the dark hair. Um, there's a little picture at the top, which you, you see just the legs of, but he signs it, Milton Avery. And it's those little touches that always often bring that element of humour. And I just wanted to show another work. I mean, this is, this is much more um, Dr. Marla Price's area than mine, but it's, um, it's looking at Henri Matisse, and, and um, it's that same... We, we, we know that, that Avery would have seen Matisse's work, certainly at first hand in his gallery, but also at exhibitions at MoMA. And that kind of same restrained description of the figures in side view is evident here. And the tendency that, that Avery um, began in, in, in these works of the 1940s continued throughout the, the rest of the 40s and the 50s. And you can see the development when the colors soften and, um, and his use of non-associative colour becomes less apparent. And this is Martin Bab um, Babushka from 1944, absolutely beautiful work, which is in the exhibition. It's, so, it's, it's just so reduced, but the face is just wonderfully, wonderfully outlined. And again, you know, it, it, there's elements of Matisse are, are, are clear here. And I mentioned earlier about um, younger contemporary artists um, uh, and, and other um, modern artists being influenced by his work and continuing to be influenced by his work. And I, I, I put a few of these in the slideshow. And here's a work by Barclay Hendricks, um, a, a wonderful portrait. And that reduction of the form of the, you know, having the, the solid color of the, um, the attire of the subject and the hat, the scarf around the neck, 
so that all of the all of the attention is focused on the face is very reminiscent of of, um, of Avery's work. And then this is a later work from 1954. It's it's one of my absolute favourite um, Avery works, and it's a it's a further softening of the colour. The hues are becoming closer together. He's describing the form. You, you see the, the volume of the figure and then this tangle of arms and legs at the front. But it, it's just, it's such a clever composition. And then that reduction in detail where he's not describing the face at all. The figure is a subject. And then here is another development from M57. Um, this beautiful compositional piece where the hues again closer still and one of the things I love about this that, that you know you, you've got those very very subtle changes in color they're so harmonious it's it but the little table behind is is something that introduces very very gently a different tone that blue on the round table and then the kind of the blue gray and then the the, the color of the object on it as well but it's just such a brilliantly crafted work. And then this, I mentioned Gary Hume. It's, he is fascinated by, by Avery and Avery's color and that idea of putting different planes of color together in a very effective way. And this is, although he uses a completely different style of household paint, um, with, without any kind of texture or, or, or variation in the tone, it's, uh, it still owes a debt to, to Avery. And this breakthrough from the 1940s wasn't limited to interiors and figures. Um, Avery had, had this wonderful ability to almost mix his genres in very original ways. This is a great piece that's in the exhibition um, called Oyster Catcher. And it's almost sculptural in form, um, but, but the, the, the bird is seen in a very static landscape, um, which again is very reduced in tone. So it really does become a backdrop and the, the bird is, 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 is very um, highlighted in the foreground, almost spreading across the whole width of the canvas. And he uses a little bit of, of impasto paint on, on the wing, which is something that you'll see in the galleries when you, you, you get to see the exhibition. So there's, there's a little bit of texture there. But I love that kind of the idea of the, um, the very static landscape, of that sense of, of pent-up energy of, the, of the, the bird, this idea that there's, there's this energetic movement about to take place. And here's another example of mixing genres, landscape and, and still life, which, which is, is just great. And, and, and again, it's an indication of, of Avery's humor. Um, again, a, a beautiful, unusual composition, which just makes you smile. Um, and it's that interesting thing about, you know, the angle that you're looking down onto it. And I think that's another thing that he gets from, um, from European modernism that idea of kind of looking down onto, you think of Suzanne's table, looking, looking down. And another example of mixing genres, this is a, a wonderful work in the exhibition that comes to us from the Metropolitan Museum in New York, Swimmers and Sunbathers. And as I, I, I said um, earlier on, Avery has got this wonderful ability to put figures in the landscape and make them work together and make them almost the same subject. But he, he treats them both in the same way and, and thereby almost fuses them together. And you see here that he's, he's beginning to, to split the canvas into bands of colour and one thinks of, of very much of Rothko and the influence that he had and that, that generation of abstract expressionist painters. And then another contemporary artist, um, Peter Doig, um, which, I mean, there's so much of Avery in this work. Peter Doig is a wonderful painter, but you know, the, um, the, the, the moon and the reflection on the water is so, so Avery. The color blue of, the, of the, the sunbather, the subject, the treatment of the space, separating it into different bands. And here's another example of, of, um, 
I think this is interesting because um, I, I think he kind of makes the figure the landscape that he's he's kind of reduced the figure to almost the kind of undulation of of, um, of hills or mountains, and with the the um, the grisaille tones it emphasizes that shape even more. But it's just such a kind of cool, lovely image. So I, I, this this period of his work was just so experimental. And then we get into the, um, the, 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 how the breakthrough of the 1940s had established Avery as a leading celebrated American colorist and one who significantly influenced the next generation of American painters who understood him and the possibility, through him, the possibility of employing color to create a sense of the sublime. And much of the work of Rothko and Newman was predicated on this notion, but I think Avery does it too. I mean, there is a real sense of the sublime in these later works. And these were, many of these were executed in Cape Cod, where Avery summered for four consecutive years towards the end of his life, and often again in the company of Rothko and Gottlieb. And they show him continuing to capture nature in the way he'd always done, observing faithfully, just like he had in the earliest works from his Hartford days. But here he's paring away detail, um, and in doing so he challenges aspects of representation. And like Matisse, he pushes against the boundaries of abstraction, but also, just like Matisse, he had no intention of stepping over the threshold. And he's always open to new ideas and ways of thinking, and you can see that he picks up a lot from his, um, from his younger protégés, um, certainly the, the, the larger scale of canvas. He's painting on a much bigger scale. These canvases are a similar size to the circus painting that you saw earlier. Um, and they are very abstracted, and, and often the title is the only thing that gives the, 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 the confirms that these are these are, are representational paintings, because ultimately, um, although he was influenced by his 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 younger abstract expressionist painters, he never invented what his eye didn't witness. This is another. Um, wonderful work that comes from the Metropolitan Museum, Speedboat Wake. And again, it's that, it's that element of humor in it. It's just kind of, it's, there's, there's something kind of wonderful about depicting that scrawl almost on the, on the canvas. One of the key American art critics of the time, Clemmer Greenberg, descri described these late paintings as a magnificent flowering. Up to that point, he'd rather ignored Avery's work, but I think uh, when he saw these, these later works, he went back to reassess Avery's early works. And although Avery was moving closer to the borderline between abstraction and, and representation, he continued in these works to fulfill his lifelong quest to capture, as he put it himself, the very essence of nature. And again, like, um, like Black Sea, it's only the title that really gives you, the, that confirms that this is a, a representational painting. But the, I mean, again, you've got the bands of color running across. But the, the choice of colors is just so extraordinary. It's so impossible, but really, really beautiful. And at every time he just makes it that sort of, he gets that harmony, even with a very, very bright blanket. Um, again, this is, this is me kind of looking at, at other exhibitions that he might have seen at the time. And I was quite struck by this work by Edvard Munch, um, which is, is figures by the, the shore. Obviously, I mean, Avery wasn't interested in anything as, 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 um, as uh, uh, depressing as, as, um, as Monk, you know, who always went into the, the sort of angst-ridden subjects. But those shapes that you see in the shore um, are very reminiscent, I think, of Avery's beach blankets. And then June Bushes, which it belongs to the modern. It's the most wonderful painting. And, and one of the things I wanted to mention about this was that um, I talked earlier about how interested he was in trying to create the effect of light in those early works when he was working in impasto and how he used 
the surface of the canvas to try and have that, that reflected life across the surface. And here he's just as, as engaged in the idea and possibilities of light, but doing it in a completely different way. And they're almost kind of lit from backlit with the, the kind of the glazes of, of colour that he puts across the canvas just create this extraordinary reflected light effect. And that they have that absolute luminosity. So this is, I, I put this in the slideshow, this is the last work in, in Avery's, um, that, that Avery ever painted. Um, Hills and Sunset Sky from 1964. And by this stage, he was, he was really unwell um, and, and, and very weakened as a result of, of two heart attacks. But he must have summoned up so much energy to, to finish this work. And it is rather remarkable. And again, it's the softness of it. It's the, it's the, the colors that he uses. Um, and it's kind of, it, it's, it's softening those bands of color. You've essentially got the three bands going across, but it's, you, you've got that looping shape at the bottom. But I also wanted to just show you again a work that we saw earlier, which was Rolling Hills from the 1930s. Um, which I mentioned was one of those examples of him really leaping forward and, and looking towards his future work. And you can, you can see what I mean by that when you see these two things together. And I think what it, what it does, these, these works that are separated by 30 years, is you get a, a real sense of his development, but you also get a sense of that consistency of vision, which I think is, is, is really important in his work. So, in conclusion, um, I, I'm kind of almost asking myself this question, does the exhibition, does a contemporary reading of Avery's work help us to get closer to reappraising or confirming his position in the, in the art canon? We know that Avery's work spanned and to a certain extent became the link between two significant movements in the United States in the 20th century, American Impressionism and Abstract Expressionism, with both having an impact in his oeuvre and through his close associations with younger key members of abstract expressionism, Avery's work played an influential role as to how that, Ameri that most American of artistic movements developed and unfolded. But what is clear is that Avery was and continues to be a bridge between many artistic tendencies. As suggested earlier, he effectively bridged that gap between American Impressionism and Abstract Expressionism, taking lessons from one and passing on different lessons to the other. But he was also a bridge between European modernism and American painting at a time when so many of his generation had turned their backs on it. And as suggested by some of the contemporary artists whose work I included in this PowerPoint presentation, to this day he remains a bridge between American and European modern representational painting and contemporary artists striving to celebrate the world today. So ultimately, and as celebrated in this exhibition, Avery has given us a wonderful body of work which continues to delight and captivate and inform our view of the natural world. Work which Rothko alluded to in his memorial address for Avery in 1965 when he concluded, I rejoice for what he has left us. And I think we can all join in Rothko's sentiment. Thank you. So, I, am, I wonder if there's any questions I'd be happy to attempt to answer if there are any. Yes. I'm curious, I, I don't associate was he involved in that at all? He, um, he, he was, he, but, but um, not for long. Um, so I, I, I think you're, yeah, he, um, I think he joined for a very short time, but it didn't suit him. Um, and I think he, he was a little bit older than a lot of the artists that were on it. So I think that maybe um, was a reason for that. But, also, I kind of think he was one of those people that was never associated with any movement or tendency and didn't ever want to join a club. Um, so I think his, his steadfast individualism made him probably unsuited to be part.
part of an endeavor like that. But I think he, I think he showed his face for about two weeks. <laughs> Any other questions? I, well, to, to a certain extent, it might be invention, but I kind of see that as being the effect of brilliant light. So I think it's, you know, you know it's, it's that sometimes when you're at the beach and you've got the white sand and, you, you know, it, it just all looks so brilliant. And I think that's something that he's trying to recreate. And, it's a, it, you know, it's so masterful, the way that he's able to have that sense of, of, of that extraordinary light. But it is, it, I mean, it really is quite an exceptional work. And th there's, a, there's a few lighter ones like that. Um, but, you know, I, I, it's clear that he, he never wanted to repeat himself. And, and so many of those later works are very, very different. You know, he's, he's working on a big scale, but he's, he's experimenting still with lots of different color, light effects. Yeah? Gosh, that's quite a complicated question. So, <laughs> um, I mean, I think that one of the things that he, he did, and, and, and Sean put me right in this if I got it wrong, but I mean, I always get the impression that he really um, developed a relationship with the subject, and it had to be something that he was, it wasn't just in front of him, it was that kind of sense of engagement that he had with it. And because he was able to understand it, because he was, you know, he was observing, consuming, particularly with the, with the landscape works when he was going out and working on paper first and taking notes and, you know, there's drawings in the exhibition which kind of describe that from, from the, the, the moderns collection of Avery drawings, which is really extraordinary to, to see that and to see that, the, you know, how he's annotating it as well to give a sense of colour. Um, but... I think it's that kind of understanding and respect for the subject that really comes through in the end and his, his relationship with it. And then once, he's able, once he does that, once he establishes that, I think that's the point at which he feels he can take things away, he can start to subtract. And in his head, it's the same thing. It's, and and he's, he's, he, I think that what he would always, my impression, I can't talk for him, of course, but my impression is that he still retains enough of the detail to have the atmosphere of that place present in the work. And that becomes the really important thing, that the subject is, is, is still has a, has a presence there. 
And, but, you know, I think in other ways he was an opportunist when it came to subjects. And I, I think that um, from understanding conversations that I've had with Sean, with March, um, as well, is that he would... Um, he would see an arrangement of objects on a table and just think, gosh, that's, you know, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and, and the same with people, you know, depicting people as they were kind of lounging in the house or, or visiting. And um, so that's a kind of a slightly different relationship to the subject. But I think when it comes to the landscape, it was almost that sense of real purpose in making sure that um, he was describing the essence of what it was like to be there. I don't know if that quite answers your question. But yeah. Last, oh, another one. Yes, yes. yeah. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that uh, Greenberg uh, initially dismissed uh, Avery's work pretty much, and then 20 years later, he's very positive. I wonder, did that, that was in the early 60s, I think, did that have an impact on the critical reception of Avery? Um, undoubtedly. I mean, I think that it, Greenberg was the sort of figure that was a real tastemaker. Um, you know, I think that would be a more difficult thing to happen today because there's many voices and, and I don't know that we listen to them quite as much as that people might have done then. Um, but it did make a difference. And it's, it's also that kind of, you know, that interesting thing about the time to make up your mind about an artist's work is when they finish their last work and not when they're mid-career. And I, that, that, it, it always puts that in mind because, of course, when you're looking at the later works, you see the earlier works through the prism of the, the later works, so it changes your perception of them. And you kind of realize that this is a very, um, um, a very thoughtful very creative artist, which I don't think that that um, Greenberg picked up on in the 1940s. And it is also that thing about you know, you, well, you can you don't have to come down in one camp. You know, when you think about abstract expressionism and his celebration of elements of abstract expressionism, it certainly wasn't all of the artists involved. But um, you know, it, it, you can you can you can like representational work at the same time as as value and abstraction. Um, but I'm not quite sure that that was, that was quite the case then. Hi. Um, I was struck in the last room with those, those paintings of the pure bands of color, and it's impossible for me to look at them and not think of Bob Dylan. Mm -hmm. Was that a direct, uh, was he having a direct dialogue with Bob Dylan? Was it just coincidental? It's, I, it, it's, it's almost impossible to know. I mean, I, yeah, I, it's, it's likely, isn't it? I mean, it is likely that, that there was a, a sort of dialogue going on. And I think it's interesting that although Rothko really valued Avery and, and, and wrote and said such profound things about him, there were moments later, which you probably are aware of in Rothko's career, when he didn't want to cite the influence of Avery. And I think that's quite telling as well. So I, I kind of, I, I wonder where that, um, yeah, where the, the balance was in that relationship when it came to generating new ideas in art. Good. Oh, yes? Um, I don't know. I don't think there is. Um, but Hockney is very aware of Avery's work, and um, it's something I, I mentioned to Sean and Bocas when I was working on this exhibition that I was showing the, the checklist to Hockney and saying, "What do you think?" And he um, he he really enjoyed seeing them, and he remembers um, he remembers when he was a student in um, in London seen Avery's work at the Waddington Gallery because Leslie Waddington, um, who had a, a gallery in Cork Street, was, was the, I think, the only person who showed Avery's work in the 60s. And, and um, David was very interested in his colour 
and the, um, the quality of light. And he could see that um, Avery had got this, this unique ability to depict light and, 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 and in the landscape. You know, he's always been interested. I, I don't know of an artist who doesn't get excited when you mention Milton Avery, which I think is very telling. Good. Okay, well, listen, thank you. Thank you for the questions, and thank you for attending.